Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Music Den. I'm your host, Armando Venditti. Hoping you guys are having a good day, morning, evening, afternoon, whenever you happen to be watching this, and that you're looking after yourselves and one another. I want to welcome you to an episode that I call the Sophomore Jinx. Now, Sophomore Jinx refers to bands who release second albums, and for whatever reason, the second release does not live up to the expectations of the debut release, whether it be uh, the material on the album, whether it be uh, the push from the record company or the lack thereof, or whether it be the uh, interest from the fans. Maybe the fans had moved on from um, from the band. Um, also, That also depends on how long it took an artist to release the second album. On the flip side of that, you have uh, sophomore releases that in some cases um, either matched or surpassed the expectations of the debut release. So I have a list of 10 albums, all sophomore releases, that I'm going to go through with you that I feel have either uh, succumbed to the sophomore jinx or have surpassed the debut release and most of these artists have gone on to release uh, multiple albums and have had a good, long, successful career. So this is going to be a fun show. I had originally uh, 12 albums, but I whittled it down to uh, 10. So here we go. Coming in at number 10 is Boston with Don't Look Back. Boston, headed up by uh, Tom Schultz, the guitarist, songwriter, producer, uh, the mainstay of the band uh, throughout the band's career, released Don't Look Back in 1978, the follow-up to their massively successful uh, self-titled debut, released in 1976. Um, just a bit of context uh, for you guys. The debut album from Boston featuring the massive hit single, More Than a Feeling. Also, um, other songs of note on the album are um, For a Play, Long Time, um, massively successful album. Uh, Don't Look Back took two years to record and release. Um, and I'm not speaking out of turn when I say this. Tom Schultz is pretty much a perfectionist. Uh, every note every nuance, every uh, effect, every uh, everything to do with the recording, he needs to be in control of. And if he doesn't feel that it is ready to be released, um, he won't release it. However, Epic Records were on the band's heels to release follow-up to the debut self-titled uh, to cash in on the popularity of the album. Uh Tom Schultz did feel that he was being rushed to release this album. There are uh, eight tracks. There were uh, three singles from the album. The title track, uh, A Man I'll Never Be, uh, Feeling Satisfied. Um, it is a good album. Uh, it did sell seven million copies, uh, which is not a failure by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I don't care what anyone says. But... Um, did it match the uh, success of the uh, the debut release uh, by the industry standards? No, it did not. Um, some people would say that uh, Don't Look Back is pretty much an album of demo material. Uh, Tom Schultz wanted to hold on to the material and work on it and hone it and, and perfect it. But Epic Records were pushing for another release. So we got this album. And it is a pretty good album. Um, did it succumb to the sophomore jinx? I think it did to an extent. Because it was another um, eight years before um, Boston released their third release, third stage in 1986. So that's number 10. 
Coming in on number nine is Black Sabbath with Paranoid. Released in 1970, no, their second release of 1970, the follow-up to their uh, massively successful debut, subtitled. The original title for this album was going to be War Pigs, but Joe Smith, the head of Warner Brothers in the U.S., uh, said to the band and management, there's no way in hell that we're going to release an album with the name of War Pigs on it due to the political unrest uh, that was going on in the U.S. at the time. Uh, and, you know, with the Vietnam War, they settled on the name Paranoid. There were seven tracks. Heavy is all Get Out. Um, fantastic album. Um, as I've said in other videos, most of the tracks on this album, uh, singles, which, okay, for example, uh, in terms of singles, you had Paranoid, Iron Man, you had other notable tracks, um, War Pigs, A Hand of Doom, Electric Funeral, uh, Planet Caravan, uh, Fairies Wear Boots, Rat Salad. All of these songs, if not, I would say about 90% of these songs are still played on FM rock radio today. Uh, the other week, it was last week, I believe, I was in the van with Bob and I heard War Pigs on one station, and I switched over, and I heard uh, Furries Wear Boots on another station. So this album uh, was the launch for a successful career. Did this album um, fall to the uh, sophomore jinx? Hell no. They went on to release 17 more albums uh, throughout their long career. So that's number nine. Coming in at number uh, eight is Genesis with Trespass. Again, released in 1970, uh, the band's follow-up to their uh, debut release from Genesis to Revelation. This, to some people, and to, I guess, Tony Banks, is considered to be the true uh, Genesis album that started their career. Uh, they moved into more of, um, uh, I guess, uh, more progressive rock uh path in terms of the music they were writing, more complex, more intricate, with songs like uh, Looking for Someone, uh, Dusk, the album staple, uh, The Knife, which closes off the album at nine minutes plus, I believe. It's a fantastic album, um, very layered, very textured, a lot of use of Mellotron on, on the album, uh, thanks to Tony Banks, who plays it so brilliantly. An amazing album, um, and it would, you know, lead them out to, you know, much greater success with the following albums. Um, that's number eight. Um, and again, just, you know, did this fall under the sophomore jinx? No, not at all. Not at all. Number seven, Alice Cooper with Alice Cooper Goes to Hell. Released in 1976, his follow-up to his um, debut solo release of uh, Welcome to My Nightmare, the only release he did for Atlantic. This is on Warner Brothers. Uh, Alice Cooper Goes to Hell is seen as a sequel to Welcome to My Nightmare, uh, featuring the character of Stephen. Um, I honestly don't see the connection with the... Uh, 
with the two albums. Uh, the two notable songs for me are Go to Hell and I Never Cry. Warner Brothers, I, I would imagine they wanted to capitalize on the success of Only Women Bleed from the previous album, so they wanted Alice Cooper to write another ballad along those lines. So he and Dick Wagner came up with I Never Cry. Um, fantastic. I was going to say fantastic. Good album. Um, does it live up to uh, Welcome to My Nightmare? No. No. So I guess in that case, it does fall under the uh, the sophomore jinx because it's not a cohesive album. Um, Alice Cooper at this time was in the throes of his uh, dependency uh, situation with alcohol and drugs. And the songs are just not that strong. Again, it was produced by Bob Ezrin. But I don't know. Welcome to My Nightmare had a bit of a, had a thread going through it, had a storyline going through it. This, to me, does not have a strong enough storyline. So that's number seven. Coming in at number six is Santana with Abraxas. An amazing uh, follow-up to their debut, you know, with the uh, woman with the woman on the cover, uh, featuring uh, songs like uh, "Black Magic Woman," "Gypsy Queen," uh, "Samba Pati," um, "Oye Como Va," a wonderful fusion of Latin rhythms and rock, and, and for me, in some cases, I call it jazz fusion. A beautiful melding of those three styles just beautiful beautiful uh a hit album for the band they would go on to uh release a multitude of albums so no this album did not fall under the sophomore jinx in fact it they thrived off of the success of this album so as i check my list here Coming in at number five is Flea with Mac with Rumors. This is the uh, the incarnation of the band featuring uh as you all know, um, Mick Fleawood on drums, John McVie on bass, Christy McVie on keyboards, vocals, Lindsey Buckingham on guitars and vocals and various instruments, and of course, Stevie Nicks on uh, vocals and keyboards. Uh, follow up to their uh, debut, uh, not debut, their self titled release from 75, often known as the White Album. Um, the previous album, the White Album, had sold three million copies uh, with sing with songs like Rhiannon and uh, Over My Head and, you know, concert favorites like I'm So Afraid. With this album, with Rumors, they basically took it up about 10 notches. You had two couples at the time that in the band that were breaking up. You had uh, John and Christy McVie, who were on the verge of uh, divorce. And you had uh, Stevie Nicks and Lizzie Buckingham, who, when they came into the band, were a couple. And they broke up during the making of this album. 11 tracks in total. Amazing album. Uh, songs like Secondhand News, Dreams, uh, Never Going Back Again, Go Your Own Way, Don't Stop, Oh Daddy, The Chain, I Don't Want to Know, uh, you make love and fun. Uh, you know, it, it amazing, amazing album. Uh, Gold Dust Woman is another track on the album. Silver Springs was supposed to be on the album, but they switched it out uh, for the track I Don't Want to Know, which was another Stevie Nicks uh, composition. Um, this album, a year later, 
after it was released in 77, uh, had sold 10 million copies. I believe at this point it has sold uh, in excess of 20 million copies. Um, so did this album fall under the jinx, uh, the sophomore jinx? No, no. It surpassed expectations. Nobody knew there was going to be this successful. Um, so yeah, that's number five. Coming in at number four, the Stone Temple Pilots with Purple. Released in 1994. Uh, the band's sophomore release, uh, 12 tracks, heavy hitting album. Uh, you've got Scott Whelan on, on vocals, uh, Eric Kretz on drums, uh, Dean DeLeo on uh, guitar, Robert DeLeo on, on bass. Heavy hitting, melodic, ass kicking rock. Just an amazing album. This is one album that I don't skip any songs i listen to it all the way through with songs like uh, starts off with the rocker meat plow goes in and then uh second uh, track is the lead off single vaseline other songs of note are uh, lounge fly pretty penny which is the one of the sort of uh, acoustic ballads kind of like a beatles pastiche on the album um interstate love song which i kind of uh i kind of Compared to a bit of like a Led Zeppelin-ish quality to it. Uh, Army Ants, Unglued. All these songs are amazing. My personal favorite uh, is the last track on the album, uh, Kitchenware and Candy Bars. Odd title track name, I know. Um, track name. Odd track name. But um, it is melodic. It is uh, lush in its arrangement. Uh there are some uh, strings used, whether uh, synthetic or not, but it, it is an, a memorable track. The album I follows up their um, debut release, Core. Uh, their previous album, Core, had the one single that I did like, um, a Sex Type Thing, which is an amazing track. I think that this album surpasses uh, Core by uh, leaps and bounds. Just an amazing album. Um, did this suffer the sophomore jinx? No, not at all. Not at all. An amazing album. I saw them on this tour when they were opening for the Rolling Stones for the Voodoo Lounge tour. They were amazing. Yeah, just beautiful. Okay. Coming in at number three is Led Zeppelin with Led Zeppelin II. Released in October of 69. Uh, this is a follow-up to their uh, massively successful self-titled. Um, recorded while they were on tour to promote the first album. Uh, nine tracks on the album. Stellar, stellar. You have A uh, Whole Lot of Love. Uh, what Is and What Shall Never Be. Uh, the Lemon Song. Thank you. Uh Side two, <laughs> okay, Heartbreaker, Live and Love and Me, She's Just a Woman, uh, Ramble On, Moby Dick, Bring It On Home. That's the album, an amazing mix of blues, of ballads, of heavy rock, uh, just the guitar tone from Jimmy Page, just phenomenal, doing uh, panning effects on uh, the track Whole Lot of Love um, in the midsection. John Bonham on drums, a monster on the drums. You could rein it in, but he he had this ability just to create just a massive drum sound. Um, and some people were were saying that Led Zeppelin were a flash in the pan because they, you know, of Jimmy Page being and John Paul Jones being a well known, uh, well known session musicians. Uh, 
they didn't think that they would go beyond the first release. Well, guys, obviously they were wrong. This album to me surpasses the debut uh, by leaps and bounds in terms of production. Um, and it, it is stellar. So it's just amazing. Coming in at number two is Rainbow with Rising. Uh, released in 1976. This follows up the uh, debut release of uh, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Uh, for Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, you had Richie Blackmore with uh, Ronnie James Dio on vocals and the backing band of ALF, which was Ronnie James Dio's band. Um, after the release of the album, he basically, uh, Richie Blackmore, fired the remaining members, with the exception of Ronnie James Dio, he fired the remaining members of ALF and recruited for uh, Rainbow Rising. Um, Tony Carey on keyboards, um, Jimmy Bain on bass, Cozy Powell on drums. And you had, obviously, Richie Blackmore on guitars and um, Ronnie James Dio on uh, lead vocals. Amazing album. Stellar. This is the one album of Rainbow that I go back to most to listen to. Six tracks, uh, short album, like 33 minutes, but packs a hell of a punch. Starts off with uh, Terror Woman with an amazing keyboard uh, intro from Tony Carey. Beautiful. Uh, Run with the Wolf, uh, Starstruck, and side one ends off with Do You Close Your Eyes? Side two, uh, I should say before I go on, that some people think that Starstruck and Do You Close Your Eyes are filler material. I disagree. All killer, no filler. St uh, side two, I was going to say star two. Side two starts with um, the epic eight minute plus um, Stargazer. Beautiful drumming intro by Cozy Powell. Amazing guitar work. Um, from Richie Blackmore uh, using the uh, Munich uh, Philharmonic Orchestra. Amazing. Telling the story of basically a Svengali who is telling everyone that he can give them salvation. Follow him and he'll give you whatever you need until he starts to believe his own hype and he basically is destroyed by... Uh, basically believing that he can, um, you know, cure all evil or all ill. And um, he's basically, uh, he's basically self-destructs. Uh, um, the album ends with, as I, I call it, part two to Starstruck, A Light in the Black, another eight minute plus uh, Tour de Force, uh, and Cozy Powell and Tony Carey on the keyboards. Just an amazing, it, it is seen by, by others and by me as sort of like an answer to um, Stargazer, like where they've come out the other side of getting away from this Svengali. Uh, actually, with the lyric, did we really get away? You know, just an amazing powerhouse of an album. Uh, just heavy drums, heavy guitar, um, beautiful uh, music musicianship on this album. Uh, yes, it does surpass Richard Blackmore's Rainbow, and it does not suffer the uh, sophomore jinx. Sorry to say, but it doesn't. Coming in at number one is Queen with Queen 2. released in April of 74. This album was recorded in August of 1973, uh, follow-up to their uh, debut album, 
subtitled. Uh, for this album, they basically took the production techniques and turned it up about 100 notches. A very layered sound, a very dense textured sound uh, with uh, walls of guitars and harmony vocals, uh, ascending piano lines, descending guitar lines, uh, interweaving, uh, wrapping around one another, uh, descending vocal lines, ascending vocal lines, again, weaving around one another. Uh, 11 tracks, um, just a tour de force. This is considered uh, by some people as Queen's attempt at progressive rock. Other people would say no. I would say that if it isn't their attempt at progressive rock, it's damn near close. It starts off with the the lush instrumental uh, procession with the uh, three-part harmony guitar from Brian May. Segues into Father to Son. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, guitar work and intricate uh, harmony vocals from the band. Um, most of these songs segue into one another, with the exception of uh, the last track on side two, Seven Seas of Rye. From Father to Son, you have the gorgeous, poetic White Queen, again, with the multi-harmony uh, voc uh, vocals and the multi-guitar parts, Segwaying into um, Someday, One Day. Beautiful, ethereal piece on the vocals and the guitar work. Then the one track written by Roger Taylor on the album, Loser in the End. Uh, heavy drums, heavy guitar. Uh, talks about, you know, a warning to parents saying you really need to back off and let your kids be kids and let them grow up and make their own mistakes because it wasn't so long since you were young prior to them, so fantastic. Side two um, starts off with Ogre Battle with the intro of the backwards gong. Then it segues into the uh, harpsichord field, Fairy Fellows Masterstroke, which was inspired by a, a painting by Richard Dadd, which hung, I believe still hangs in the Tate Museum in London, I'm not sure. Then that segues into the lush, beautiful, uh, melodic, uh, Nevermore, the beautiful multi-part uh, 11 sections of the March of the Black Queen. You know, again, lush vocals, guitar work. Um, again, Roger Taylor had said it was quite intricate when they recorded it. 11 different sections uh, using uh, uh, polyrhythmic and polymetric uh time signatures at the same time, okay? So if if that isn't progressive rock, I don't know what the hell is, right? Then it goes into the, uh, I call it the Phil Spector-esque Funny How Love Is with a wall of acoustic guitars and harmony vocals. And it ends with the uh, top 10 single, uh, the UK top 10 single of Seven Seas of Rye. Again, a uh, mix of harmony vocals, heavy guitar, heavy drums, As again, ascending uh, vocal lines, descending guitar lines, just an amazing, amazing mix. And it ends off with a bit of um, an old, uh, um, I guess you'd say an old British uh, folk song, um, I do like to be beside the seaside, you know, um, just the overall packaging of the album, the uh, black and white uh motif the side one being called uh side white side two being called side black the front the cover with the four of them with the head and shoulders shot um on on the front in black and in the gatefold in white you know just have mirroring mirroring the shots just an amazing and a cover that was a shot that was taken by uh Famed photographer, a uh, rock photographer, uh, Mick Rock, who we lost a few years ago. Rest in peace. Just an amazing, an amazing album. This is the one album that I say is my favorite Queen album. I know people are thinking, you know, oh, you know, what, and I had the opera, uh, I date the races, you know, 
Um, and I love all those albums to death. I really do. But this is the one album that I go back to most often than not. Um, it is full of emotion, full of uh, beautiful harmonies, hooks galore, fantastic guitar work. Does it fall under the um, sophomore jinx? No. Upon release, it um, reached number uh, 49 in the U.S. charts, whereas the uh, debut from Queen reached number 84 in the U.S. charts. So they were a band on the rise at that point. For me, with this album, they took it up about, again, another 100 notches, and they never looked back. So that is my list of my uh, 10 albums that have either fall into the uh, sophomore jinx or have surpassed it. So that's it for now. Please, uh, when you see this, please put your list down below in the comment section. Put your list. doesn't have to be five out, uh, 10 albums. Could be five, could be three. And let me know what you think. Um, you know, it's all about opinion, right? And everyone has an opinion. So that's it for now. Uh, coming up on the channel, uh, Bill Schuster and I are starting a new series our top five albums uh, from 1970 to 1979. Uh, we're going to start filming that on Friday. Bill has informed me today that he has already worked on the list from 1980 to 1989. So I got to catch up. So on this new uh, series, we're going to be talking about our top five albums from each year, from 70 to 79. Uh, and we're going to have two honorable mentions. So I got to finish my list and get ready for Bill because he's ahead of me. And uh, that's not a good thing. So um, I want to thank everybody for watching. And I want to, again, thank everybody for the support. Please look after yourselves and one another. And I will see you soon with another video. Bye for now.